All right, well, welcome. I am Michael, a.k.a. Hezzy, and this is my buddy Matt, a.k.a. Hondo, and even though he's from St. Louis, he wears a Red Sox jersey because he is a trader. All right, well, we're going to try something new here. We're going to see if it works. If it's terrible, just let us know. But we're each going to draft an all-decade team for the 2010s. So here's how it's going to work. We're going to each take turns selecting players. Uh, we cannot select the same players, so our teams have to be completely unique. Each position has to be filled by a player who played the majority of their games at that position. So, for example, you know, Ian Kinsler played one game at first base or third base. You can't use him in that position just so that you can get him in your lineup. Yep. We are only looking at stats from 2010 to 2019 because, of course, this is an all-decade team. We'll let, the, we'll let the guest go first here so you can take the first pick. So. That. First overall pick in the all-decade 2010s fantasy draft. Here we go. So my first overall pick. I feel like it's a bit of an obvious one here when you talk 2010s. There's really only one player that I would start with, and that's going to be starting pitcher for Los Angeles Dodgers, Mr. Clayton Kershaw. Wow. I was considering between Kershaw and, of course, Mike Trout. I mean, if you had taken Trout first pick, I was going to probably take Kershaw second yeah. pick. So it's a good pick. Yeah. yeah, That is a bummer. I really wanted Kershaw. Mm. He's my favorite pitcher. Yep. <laughs> a few days ago, I was taking Verlander over Kershaw, and I started looking at the stats, looking at the awards, and uh, pretty quickly, you got to go Kershaw. <laughs> Kershaw is the best. So. Yeah, he had one of the best prime uh, six- to seven-year yeah. peaks of any pitcher of all time. So, yeah. All right, so we're going uh, my first pick here. Yeah, I think I'm just going to play the chalk here. I think it's going to have to be Mike Trout. Yep. Um, yeah, when you start digging into Trout's numbers, the things he did during the 2010s, pretty much from his first season, he was an all-star every year since he started playing Yeah, full-time. his first full <laughs> year, he led the league in runs scored, stolen bases, and OPS+. Plus. Yep. And he pretty much did that all the way up through 2019 until he started struggling with injuries. So, yeah, three yep. MVPs. I mean, Mike Trout is Mike Trout. Yep. I don't think we need to explain too much more. <laughs> no doubter. All right, well, my second pick here, I'm going to go with uh, Mr. Miguel Cabrera. I don't know. When you have a guy that hit for the Triple Crown within that decade, something that hadn't been done since, I think it was the 60s, if my notes are right. Yep, 67 when Yastrzemski did it. I mean, it's hard to hard to pass on, on those kind of stats. Well, and that's an interesting pick at first base because, first of all, first base is loaded. You've got Votto. You've got Goldschmidt. You've got Freeman. You've even got Anthony Rizzo, who had a great yep. decade. Uh, and Votto technically collected a lot more war during the decade. So, you know, if you're looking at statistics, you can make an argument for Votto. But if you're just talking about the legacy of the game and thinking about star power mm -hmm. and all decade type stuff, I, I do agree. I think Cabrera is probably the guy. Yep. All right. So for my second overall pick, uh, I think I'm going to do something that goes against my heart uh, because I don't really love the player. But there's just such a big gap between this guy and the next guy at his position. So I'm going to go with Robinson Cano for my next pick. He uh, really accumulated a lot of counting stats and a lot of war. He played the whole decade, all 10 years, um, has the best OPS plus among all second basemen, good defensive ratings as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the guy hit 230 bombs as a second baseman. Mm -hmm. Uh, and almost 900 RBIs as a second baseman while also playing good defense. And like I said, it just to me seems like there's such a big gap between him and the next guy that I wanted to snag him off the board. Yeah. When you start looking at his stats and things he did, both in New York and Seattle for most of his career, I mean, he's a good pick right there for Pretty sure. Pretty much just raked for a yeah. long time. <laughs> <laughs> so with my next pick here, so this is going to be fifth overall. So I'm going back to the starting pitcher bin. So I'm going with my fifth or the fifth overall pick, my third one with Justin Verlander. So like Kershaw, Verlander pretty much dealt the entire 2010s. Um, something interesting between Kershaw and Verlander, they've actually won back-to-back -back MVP. So not only were they Cy Young winners multiple times, but they both as pitchers picked up MVPs, which I hadn't been done since Eckersley did it in I think 92. If I'm wrong, correct me on that. Yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with a multiple Cy Young guy, a, yep. a pitcher who won the MVP, won the Triple Crown of pitching, just completely dominated the decade. Um, well, since you're on a pitching tear, I'm afraid you're going to take the next guy <laughs> before is, I get a chance. It's coming up. So, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and take Max Scherzer with my next pick. Uh, and for me, I think Scherzer and Verlander are pretty much neck and neck here. I probably actually would have taken Scherzer over Verlander. I know he's a Verlander guy. I'm more of a Scherzer guy. 
but it also might be a little bit – I'm a homer. Scherzer is from St. Louis. Yeah, I mean, either way, for me, I feel like it's just a coin flip between those two. Yeah. All right. Well, my next pick, I'm going to fill the other side of the infield. Uh, so I got Cabrera at first base, and I'm going with your boy. You're probably not going to be too excited about this one, but Adrian Beltre <sighs> at third base. Yeah, I mean, he's one of those guys that – he came up in uh, 98, so – Came up early, came up young, but then in the 2010s, he really started raking. He didn't make his first All-Star game till 2010, but then he popped off four out of five years in a row, and he just put up consistent numbers, like right around the 200 hit mark. He was a gold glover, silver slug ward. He had multiple MVP voting years and never won it, but he was up in the top 10 for several. And plus, if you're just a fan of baseball, a fan of people that love the game, like watching him play is one of the most fun things ever. Like he loves the game. He loves playing it. So I want him on my team. So I'm going Adrian Beltre at third base. Yeah, Beltre is one of my favorite players of that generation for sure. He was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. He does everything well. He never had like that peak MVP season, but he was just consistently great for a long, long time. And that's all that gets down to the argument of like, do you want a guy that had a three, four year stretch of dominance, or do you want a guy who put up the entire decade, 10 years of just consistent great numbers? Well, that's and, a perfect segue into my next pick, ooh, I think, because purpose. I'm going to go down the board, at least on the war leader board a little bit here on this one. Okay. I'm going to take Jacob deGrom for my next pick. Ooh, okay. So this is a little bit of a dicey I feel call. like this is the first controversial pick here. This is I would argue this one. This is a controversial pick for an all-decade team because yeah. he didn't start his career until 2014. So he didn't miss the first okay. four years of the decade. So I can understand why you wouldn't want him in the all-decade team, but... I mean, he wrapped up the decade by winning the Cy Young Award two times. And kind of similar to Kershaw, his peak numbers are not just great for the decade. They are all-time peak elite numbers. DeGrom was just an absolute beast. And I just feel like if I'm starting a real team and I have to pick between Cole Hamels or David Price on this war list, you know, uh, versus Jacob DeGrom, I'm going DeGrom all day. Assuming he's healthy, which is, yeah. of course, not always the case. <laughs> For the 2010s, but, you could assume but that. But <laughs> if you're talking about their peaks, I'm taking to ground. Yeah. All right. So my next pick, I am going to fill my power bat need with probably the premier slugger of the 2010s. And that's going to be a Mr. Mike Giancarlo Stanton. Mm. So I'm putting Stanton out in right field. He just rate for the 2010s i mean he has slugging percentages consistently over five six hundred um it was the 2017 season that if you remember the race was on for 60 he ended at 59 home runs i do remember he was on my fantasy team that year so yes (laughs) he won the mvp uh he won the mvp that season uh multiple time all-star and he was actually back then still a pretty good fielder as well so he wasn't he wasn't a liability i don't think he won any gold gloves no he did not but he wasn't terrible in the outfield his knees and all of his other body parts hadn't gone out yet. So um, for my pick, I'm going to go with um, John Carlos Stanton and Wright. There's kind of a theme here with some of these guys I'm noticing. you got Trout, DeGrom, and Stanton already, some of the top players here mm. that early on in their peak, they were incredible. But now in the last handful of years, they've all been struggling with injuries so yeah. much that there's no chance they're going to make the all-decade team for the 20s. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so for my next pick, uh, I think I'm just going to play the chalk again and go with with Total War. I'm going to have to go with Joey Votto at first base, I, which is a great pick for me. I I love Joey Votto. I know some some people, you know, they try to say he's a little overrated, maybe because he doesn't run the bases very well. He doesn't play great defense. He draws too many walks, and he's boring to watch. But I just love Joey Votto. He's just such a professional hitter. And, I mean, I love the Saber metrics, so I love the on-base percentage and the OPS plus and all that stuff. So, yeah, I, I, Joey Votto, to me, uh, he's going to go. He's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer, I think, and he's going to go down as one of the best pure hitters of all time. So Yeah, it always blew my mind when people were complaining about him not swinging enough and taking walks. I mean, when you're putting up for the 2010s, he had an on-base percentage of 428 and 409 for his <laughs> career. So you're literally trying to find something to complain about for a guy that's getting on base 40 plus percent of the time. It's like, okay, he could have had a few more RBIs, but also, I mean, I'll take 400 plus OBP any day. (laughs) Yeah. And this, this is a tough pick too, because, uh, first base I think is the most loaded position in terms of this exercise that we're doing here with the all decade team, because picking Vado and Cabrera for first base means we're leaving out Paul Goldschmidt, a future Hall of Famer, mm-hmm. Freddie Freeman, a future Hall of Famer, 
Anthony Rizzo, not going to be a Hall of Famer, but still had a really great decade. I mean, Anthony Rizzo had 200 home runs and almost 750 RBIs for the decade, mm-hmm. and he's only probably your fifth pick at the position. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even names like Adrian Gonzalez towards the end of his career, you forget. Jose Abreu was coming up in the, the mid to late 10, so... There was, uh, there was some crazy well, and, numbers. And again, Albert Pujols led not only first baseman, but all of the major leagues in RBIs for the whole decade. And he's, what, you know, seventh or eighth on the on the list of war mm-hmm. for first baseman for the decade. So, yeah. All right. Well, my next pick, I'm going to go with my center field spot, and I'm going to take Andrew McCutcheon. Hmm. Much like you, when it came to Votto, I loved watching Andrew McCutcheon play, man. He's this... A gamer through and through, a guy that does everything, not just well, but great on the field. I mean, he stole bases, he hit for power, he hit for average, he was a great defender, and he had the beautiful locks for most of the 2010s, so that bumped him up my list a little bit. He did pick up the uh, MVP in 2013, so as a you know a center fielder who wasn't hitting 40, 50 bombs, at that season he hit 21. It just showed his overall value that he was MVP. Yeah, and I think it's a pretty easy pick here with only two guys in the draft because the next uh, guys down on the list, there's a pretty big drop-off. I mean, mm-hmm. after Trout and McCutcheon in center field, you're looking at guys like Lorenzo Cain, Adam Jones, Kevin Kiermeyer. Those guys, to me, are just not in the same tier as yeah. McCutcheon and Trout. So, yeah, it's a it's yeah. a pretty easy pick, I think. Okay, so for my next pick, I think I'm going to make probably, for half the country, another controversial pick here. Because for this decade, there's really only two guys at this position. It's Posey and it's Molina. Oh, no. And obviously, I'm wearing my Cardinals gear, so I'm going to have to go with Yadier Dang. Molina. Dang. So, he was going to be my next pick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, good. I stole yeah, it from you. Did. you. So, did. yeah, I mean... When you look at the counting stats, when you look at the offensive stats, and when you look at the war, Posey's the guy, right? I mean, mm-hmm. according to war, Posey was worth almost 10 more wins in the decade than, than Yachty was. But as we both know, guys who grew up in St. Louis, Yachty's the kind of player who he brings so much to the table that just doesn't show up in the stat sheet yeah. and just cannot be quantified. And so mm-hmm. when you watch him every day, you know how valuable he really is. He did have some peak really good offensive seasons for a catcher as well. Yeah, just everything he brings to the table defensively and for the pitching staff. I mean, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm taking Yachty. Yep. Yeah. I mean, when you win four, I think it was four out of the ten uh, platinum gloves. Yeah. And the thing that always blows me away about Yachty is that you know Posey. You know, towards the end of the 2010s, he was catching around 100 to 80 games a season, where Yadi was still putting up 120, 130 games behind the plate the entire decade. So it's like, as a catcher at the position, the value that he brought, that's why he was going to be my next pick. Yadi's the man. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, for my next pick, I'm going back to the starting rotation. There um, you go. As you I can see, as you can see, growing up, I was a pitcher. I love the pitchers, and I love me some Chris Sale, baby. I knew it. Red Sox jersey. Yep. You're going Chris Dude, Sale. Sale. I like forget because there's Verlander, because there's Kershaw, because there's Scherzer. I even as a Red Sox fan, sometimes forget how good Chris Sale was, especially in that peak of the 2010s. I mean, he uh, took a couple notes here. So he was a seven-time All-Star in those 10 years. He finished top six in Cy Young voting for those seven years as well. He was just fun to watch, man. Yeah. Like seeing a guy throw from that angle with that movement. And it almost reminded me of Randy Johnson, just how tall and how lanky he was. He was, he was great. Okay, so I'm also going to take a picture for my next pick. Uh, I'm going to go with Zach Granke for my next picture. Next on my list, too. Uh, technically, according to the war leaderboard... Cole Hamels would be the guy to go with there. But for me, I just can't stomach taking Cole Hamels over Zach Granke. I mean, in his prime, Granke was a a lot better than Cole Hamels. Of course, Granke won his Cy Young Award in 2009, which is right before this decade started. But, I mean, if you look at their numbers, Hamels versus Granke, their innings pitched for the decade are almost identical. But, you know, Granke's got a better ERA. He's got a better whip. He's got a better ERA+. plus. To me, Granke's just... He's more of a premier pitcher. If you're starting a rotation, you start with Granky before you start with Hamels, in my opinion. And he's going to be a Hall of Famer as well. So I think if you're going all-decade team, you got to pick the Hall of Famers, right? Yep. And you get a lot better stories with Granky as well. If you need a member of your Dungeons & Dragons team, he's the guy to add. <laughs> all right. So next up for my uh, next pick is going to be second baseman, Jose Altuve. 
So really, when we're looking at second base, yeah. Him. So I was looking at Ian Kinsler. Um, Kinsler had a pretty good, pretty good 2010s. He he was one of those guys that was just consistent, put up solid numbers. Didn't have a peak year, but Altuve did start in 2011, so he had one year less, but pretty much immediately. His first season, he only played in about 60 games, and then he hopped into full-time in 2012, and he was an all-star his first year, put up 30-plus stolen bases, almost a 300 average, and didn't stop from there. I mean, he's stealing 30, 50, 30-plus bases a season. He's putting up gold gloves, silver slugger awards, and just hit the ground running and didn't look back. So I love Altuve. I don't know. Altuve is great, but I honestly don't think I agree with this pick. I'm looking at the second baseman, and if you had taken Cano, I was probably either going to take Kinsler or maybe even Pedroia over mm-hmm. Altuve. I mean, Altuve, if you look at the offensive numbers, Altuve is the clear pick there. But Pedroia just played – I think Pedroia was a better defender. I think he brought more to the table in terms of just his overall game and you know, also when you're when you're making a lineup, you want at least one of those scrappy guys, you know. And Pedroia is a real scrappy player. Yeah. And I just I don't know. I probably I'd probably go Pedroia there. Yeah. As a Red Sox fan, I I mean it, it hurt me not to take Pedroia, but he just tailed off so much at the end of the tens. I mean, his last couple seasons, he was limping by pretty much, yeah. and he definitely was you know the heart of the Red Sox. He was the uh, the driving force in that lineup. Also, how do player. you feel? Also, how do you feel about having a second baseman who literally can't throw it to first base in the playoffs? <laughs> how do you hey. feel about that? It, as it, long as he's hitting 400, I'm okay with it. <laughs> All right, so my next pick here, I'm gonna go with right fielder Mookie Betts. I know, again, as a Red Sox guy, that hurts you. I know yep. you wanted him. Um, but you already took Stanton, so that's your fault. Yep. So I'm going to take Betts. Uh, again, if I'm starting a real team, Betts is not only an elite offensive player. As we all know, he does everything amazingly. He's a five-tool player. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I don't even know if I really have to justify this argument. It's either Mookie Betts or Jason Hayward. So I'm obviously <laughs> going with Betts here. <laughs> to say, hey, kid, come on. Yeah. Now, I will say the one thing that hurts me about this pick, though, is that means Bryce Harper is not going to make the mm. all-decade team. Yes. So when you look at the raw totals, Harper's probably not there, although he did hit 200 home runs in the decade. He did win an MVP in 2015, and, you know, he was kind of like the golden boy. You know, he came up with Trout. In terms of star power, it's hard to leave Harper off the all-decade team, I feel mm. like. But when you look at the numbers, I think you got to go yeah. with Betts. And it also shows you how good Betts is because he played two less seasons in Harper, and he put up almost 10 more war for the decade in two less seasons than one of the greatest of the last yeah, 15 Yeah, and again, years. that's where the defense so, and the base running, he just yeah. does everything yeah, so Yeah, I mean, well. he's a freaking shortstop now, so the yeah. dude's just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so... For my next pick, I'm going to fill out my starting rotation. So I'm going to take one here that may be a bit of a surprise, though. There's still guys on the board like David Price, Madison Bumgarner, Strasburg. But I'm going to pick old King Felix here. Okay. So I love me some King Felix playing for the Mariners. Everyone knew he was great, but I don't feel like he got the love he deserved. When you start looking at his stats, and especially about a five- or six-year peak there in the middle of the 2010s, from 11 to 15, he was a five-time All-Star every year, but he was just flat-out nasty for that decade. I mean, he was putting up two to low three ERAs almost every season, striking out over 200 guys from 2010 up to 14. He had 200-plus Ks a season. Just nasty. I remember watching people face him in the 2010s and just seeing, like, he was one of those pitchers that when guys faced him, you could tell he was just unhittable. So I'm going with old King Felix. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the raw totals and some of the numbers, you know, it's kind of hard to justify the pick. But if you actually followed the game during Mm -hmm. the decade, you remember how great Felix really was. And I always felt like he's one of those guys that if he played in a bigger market, Mm -hmm. if he played on a good team that actually made the postseason, who knows what that guy could have done in the postseason. He's just, yeah, he was just really incredible. That's Mm -hmm. a good pick. Okay, so for my next pick, I'm also going to take a starting pitcher. I'm going to go ahead and complete my rotation as well. And this is a tough one for me. You've got Hamels left on the board. You've got Bumgarner. You've got Kluber. You've even got Cueto. You've got Gio Gonzalez, Steven Strasburg. Even John Lester, I think, has a decent argument to Mm -hmm. maybe make this rotation. But for me, I think I'm going to go with Corey Kluber. Um, His peak was just a little bit better than all those guys, I feel like. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did win two Cy Youngs. I almost went with David Price because David Price, 
was also one of my favorite pitchers, and I feel like probably a little bit underrated. But Kluber was just so dominant there for a few years in that decade. It's just hard for me to leave him out of my rotation. Yeah, that's a good pick. Definitely a good pick. Some key color commentary there. (laughs) (laughs) I I deleted him off my list. I didn't have him available to click. (laughs) All right, you're up. All right, so for my next pick, I'm going to go with a guy that we talked about earlier. It breaks my heart a little bit because I wanted the alternative, but... It's a nice consolidation prize to get Buster Posey as your catcher. So Posey in the 2010s was just a stud. You don't really have to say too much about him other than when it comes to hitting catchers, arguably one of the greatest, one of, the greatest of all time. And he could play defense too. He wasn't like a, a guy up in no, he the, was great. A guy up with the Mets like Piazza who was just hitting dingers and dropping strike threes. So I'm going with Buster Posey as my catcher. I really wanted Molina, but he got off the board a little earlier, but I am more than happy to slide Posey behind the plate. He's the only catcher that I see that hit 300 for the entire decade. He Mm. had 302 as a catcher for a full (laughs) decade, which is crazy. Uh, Led all catchers in OPS. Uh, I think he led all catchers in doubles as well. Uh, Probably run scored. I mean, yeah, it's like I said, it's a, it's a two-horse race at catcher Posey and Molina. So, yep. all right. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna switch it up here. I'm gonna try to steal a guy uh, at a position we haven't drafted from yet. Ooh. I'm gonna go to the relief pitcher okay. market, okay. and I'm gonna take Craig Kimbrell for my mm. first reliever. For me, I think you know between Chapman and Kimbrell, it's tough. Uh, they were both so dominant, but for me, for some reason, I just feel like I'd rather have Kimbrell. I just think Kimbrel's stuff, even though he didn't throw as hard, his stuff was a little bit nastier at his peak. And Mm. I personally, as a hitter, obviously I've never seen Major League pitching, but I feel like I'd probably rather face Chapman as crazy as that is to say. But at his peak, (laughs) Kimbrel was just so unhittable. That slider or whatever he called it was just so nasty. Mm. You couldn't couldn't touch him at his peak. Yeah, he led the decade in saves by a pretty wide margin, by almost 50 saves. So if you want to go with just the counting stats, I think he's your guy too. So yep. I got a shortstop and a left fielder left, which are probably the two weakest positions. And I'm going to slide into left field, Christian Yelich. Okay. So Yelich came up in 2013 as a 21-year-old. And then in 2014, he was playing full-time. He put up 21 steals, didn't put up the power number as much early. His first two seasons, he only had nine and seven home runs. But then 16 through 19, his power numbers jumped to 21, 18, then 36 and 44 bombs. Good power numbers. He's putting up RBIs. He's still stealing bases. You know, what does he got here? 30, 22 stolen bases. So he had a... Still had the wheels too. He was the MVP in 2018 with the Mar or with Milwaukee at that point. So that was his first year in Milwaukee. He started trailing off after 2019, but he was still an All Star in 19. And then he also had the good on base, good OPS numbers. He had two uh, seasons of a thousand plus OPS. So the dude could just rake in the tens. Yeah, and, I mean uh, he led the league in OPS two years in a row, and he also won two batting titles in a row. Yep. He finished top two in MVP voting. So yep. he ended the decade with a bang. Yep. So yeah, that's a. It's a tough pick for me because, again, he didn't come up until 2013. And even then, he didn't really get going Mm. at an elite level for a few more years. So, to me, it's like two or three great years at the end of the decade. I'm not sure I like that pick, but... Hey, it's your team. It's not my team. When we look at the alternatives, I'm interested to see who you're going to pick. When you look at the alternatives, yeah, that's why I lean with Yelich. So. Okay, so for my next pick, I'm going to go try to steal the shortstop that I want since you've already picked Ooh. a third baseman. And this might be a little controversial, but I'm going to go Troy Tulowitzki okay. for my shortstop. Um, when you think defensively, obviously, Andrelton Simmons is the guy to go with for the decade, one of the all-time great defenders. If you look at war, Simmons is the guy you go with. But if you're thinking just star power, stud power, uh, for me, you got to go with Tulowitzki. <laughs> He's more fun to watch. And when he was at his peak, he was just an absolute dynamo. I mean, one of the best hitting shortstops of my lifetime, at least. And mm-hmm. for me, when I think of, you know, the best shortstops of the generation, I I think Tulowitzki before I think Simmons. Maybe that's just a silly thing on my end, but... I'm not a huge subscriber to the course field, um, bashing a guy for that. Like, I hate that 
Helton got it. I hate that Larry Walker gets it when it comes to Hall of Famers. You know, you Arnado. play where you play, Arenado. And I know by the time he left Coors and went to Toronto and New York, he was older at that point. Wasn't the same guy, but his numbers did drop off substantially. So, well, I although, think that was more due to injury. Yeah, than yeah, Coors he Field. was old and hurt. I'm sure Coors Field affected his numbers for sure, just yeah. like it does everybody. But I mean, when you look at his offensive numbers the gap between him and the next guy at their peak is still so big that just like Arnato and Walker, when they left, they were still great hitters. I mean, Arnato had some of his best seasons here in St. Louis, and I think Tulowitzki would have been the same. The numbers may not have been quite as inflated, but, I mean, the dude was a a ball player. All right, so my next pick, I'm going to fill my DH spot. I'm going to take old Big Poppy as my DH. So yeah, here's the thing about Big Poppy. So he retired in 16. Um, so it, from 2010 to 2016, those were his age 34 to 40 seasons. He retired at 40, and he was an all-star his year 40 <laughs> season. He retired yeah. as a 40-year-old all-star and put up the most doubles of his career his last season as a 40-year-old He put up 48 doubles, which was the most of his career. So those seven years from 10 to 16 that he played in the the decade, he put up elite numbers at DH and his big poppy. For me, I didn't have him as my top DH because, like you said, he didn't play the last three years of the decade. And also, as a Cardinals fan, I hate the guy. (laughs) He killed us in in the World Series, not once, but twice. (laughs) So you're not going to see Big Poppy on my team, but I'm happy for you. That's not his fault. That's your fault for pitching to him. Yeah, that, that 2013 World Series, it felt like we didn't get Big Poppy out the whole series. You I didn't. mean, it just felt like every time he came up to the plate, he was doing damage. So mm-hmm. since you've already got some of these other positions filled that I need, mm-hmm. I'm going to go for another reliever oh, here. No. <laughs> so I'm going to take Araldis Chapman for my number two uh, reliever. So uh, I'm not I'm not playing the board in terms of overall war. But, you know, again, if we're looking at this as a real team, I want a, not only a ninth inning guy, but I want an eighth inning guy as well. So I feel pretty good about Chapman and Kimbrell uh, yeah. uh, taking care of the back end of my bullpen here. So I'm going to start knocking out some relief pitchers. My first relief pitcher is going to be maybe a bit of a surprising one. When you look at the war numbers, he's a lot farther down on the list. I think he's number like 17 or 18 on the decade. So I'm actually going to be going with Wade Davis here. Okay. So one's closer Dicey for the call. Royals. And Davis is a very interesting case when it comes to relief pitcher in the 2010s because he was a starter as well so in 2010 and 11 he actually started 29 games he was still a starter he got moved to the bullpen in 12 by the um rays where he pitched 54 games out of the bullpen and put up a 2-4-3 era got traded to the royals went back to the starting rotation started 24 games and put up a 5-3-2 ERA as a starter again. And then everyone realized, okay, he's not a starter. He's a bullpen guy. Got put back in the bullpen in 14. And listen to these numbers. Once he goes back to the bullpen in 14 for the Royals, 2014, one ERA. 2015, 0.94 ERA. 2016, 1.87. 17, he was at 2.3. And then he starts uh, dropping off a pretty big cliff after that. But that stretch of 2014 to 2017, when he became the Royals' closer, he may have been, if not the most dominant, one of the top there two was a year a couple years there where he had an argument as the best reliever in yep. baseball so it's not a terrible pick for an all decade team i think it's a bit of a stretch it's hard but, because he yeah. was a starter so yeah. it's like you look at a guy that was a starter for four of those seasons three of those seasons it sways his number and even his war i think is swayed because yeah. he was such a bad starter as a reliever he was way more valuable to his team Okay, so for my next pick, I'm going to finally take my third baseman here. It's a guy who, when you look at the war leaderboards, he's dropped pretty far uh, in this draft, but uh, I'm going to go with Evan Longoria. He never had like these huge MVP caliber seasons, but he just really solidly puts up good numbers every year. Mm -hmm. And as long as he's healthy, which he's had some health issues and stuff, but as long as he's healthy, I mean, he's the kind of guy you can rely on. He's going to put up good numbers. To me, when you look at the rest of the third baseman in this draft, you know, you've got Josh Donaldson. The one that was tricky for me was, well, now I'm even going back and thinking about taking Arnado. It's like, gosh. (laughs) Honestly, was good. I had Arenado as my uh, number two third baseman. Oh, Machado, for sure. even freaking Machado, Machado is there too. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Machado. So I feel like Machado and Arenado are like the entire careers. Like, 
I, yeah, I had Arnado as my okay, number two. Yeah. <laughs> scratch it, scratch it. I'm taking back my pick. I originally was well, going to pick. <laughs> I originally was going to pick Longoria for my third baseman just because of the raw totals. But now I'm going down the list of third baseman, and I see two names: Nolan Arnado and Manny Machado. And in my mind, I'm just like, I just can't stomach picking Longoria over either of those guys mm. personally. Uh, Machado came up in 2012, so he missed the first two years. Arnado came up in 13, so he missed the first three years of the decade. But, I mean, when you think of the third baseman of their generation, it's Arnado and Machado over Longoria for me. Yeah. And I think it's it's a tough call, but I'm going to go with Arnado. To me, the defense separates Arnado even more. I mean, oh, yeah. offensively, Machado and Arnado were both incredible. Both have an OPS plus of about 120 for the decade. Machado plays great defense, too. Mm-hmm. But to me, Arenado defensively is an all-time great. Yep. Probably top, you know, two or three defensive third baseman of all time. Mm-hmm. Plus, he's got the bat. So, he missed the first few years. But in my heart, I just have to go with Arenado. Yeah. He comes up in 2013. By 2015, he's already top 10 in MVP voting. And from 15 to 19, he's top 10 every year. Gold yeah. Glove winner, Platinum Glove winner. I think Arenado. Yeah, and the, I mean... Uh, it, if you want to talk about the course field effect, sure, his numbers are affected a little bit. But again, the defense alone, you could mm-hmm. probably, kind of like in Jilton Simmons, you could justify putting him on this roster just for his defense yep. anyway. So anything offensively is just a bonus with him. <laughs> I, I, I originally went Longoria, and I hated myself for it yep. 20 seconds later. All right, so I'm going to throw my second relief pitcher pick and looking at the numbers this probably should have been my first relief pitcher pick over Wade Davis uh I forget how good Kinley Jansen was in the 2010 so I'm picking Kinley Jansen uh something cool about Jansen he came up in 2010 with the Dodgers and he pretty quickly became their closer you don't always see that with young guys he was 22 when he came up by 2012 he was their full-time closer he had 25 saves in 12 28 and 13 40 36 47 so he's Closing games for the Dodgers pretty quickly and just putting up elite numbers. I mean, ERAs in the one and two throughout the decade. His FIP barely gets above two if it does in any of the seasons in the decade. Uh, 0.91 whip for the Mm -hmm. entire decade is insane. Yep. Well, and Jansen's the only guy other than Kimbrell to get 300 saves in the decade. So if you just look at saves... He's, you know, he's one of the guys you go with. The interesting thing, too, when you look at these top three guys, Kimbrell, Chapman, Jansen, they all played the full decade from age 22 to 31. So they mm-hmm. they came up at the exact same age in that decade, and uh, their numbers are all pretty similar. Jansen is not too far behind these guys. Nope. Like I said, his whip is actually even better, um, but the ERA is a little higher. The <laughs> ERA is a little higher. The hits per nine are a little higher. Uh, the the home runs per nine are a little higher. Mm. So I think he's a slight tier yeah. below, but it's pretty close. Man, I hate to do this. I really don't want to do this. <laughs> I'm thinking about Ryan Braun in left field, but... Yeah, I mean, his peak started in 2007. You know, he had three of his peak years before this decade started, and then three peak years into this decade 10 11 and 12 and then the rest of the decade you know he was good but not great and especially after the all of the ped stuff his numbers went down left field is just real shallow in this decade i mean you took yelich i don't want to take braun the next guys after that you've got brett gardner justin upton alex gordon Michael Brantley. I love Alex Gordon. I had him on my fantasy team for a mm-hmm. long time. He was very consistent. I think I... Oh, let me take one more look here. <laughs> I, th- I think I'm going to have to go with Justin Upton yeah, in left field. I, I mean, he played the whole decade in his prime. Uh, he scored more runs than Ryan Braun. He scored over 800 runs. He had just a few less doubles than Braun, uh, but he had 14 more home runs than Braun. Uh, by RBIs, they're only separated by 13 RBIs. Defensively, neither of them rate super well defensively. Mm-hmm. But for me, if I'm thinking the stretch from 10 to 19, I just feel like Upton was a little more consistent throughout the whole decade. It's it's not a great pick, I don't feel like, for an all-decade team. You don't think of Justin Upton, yeah. but it is what it is. I mean, for this 10-year stretch, the left field uh, position was just a little shallow. Yep. I'm almost Can't tempted to take Alex Gordon. I Gordon love was Alex a stud, Gordon, man. He was great. <laughs> I think you got to go Upton. Yep. So, like we've been saying here for the last few picks, shortstop and left field were both 
uh, fairly shallow for this decade. So you took too low. We do still have Andrelton Simmons on the board, who his defensive numbers just insanely inflate his war. He's by far the best defender of the decade. Um, you got guys like Elvis Andrews, Xander Bogars came up in 13. Elvis Andrews had a sneaky good decade. So Andrews was consistent. I did look at him. I didn't pick him, but he was just a consistent all around. He finished the entire decade second in stolen bases. Not just for second baseman, but I think among all hitters uh-huh. behind D. Gordon for yeah. the whole decade. Yeah. I mean, he only put up a 331 on base, though. Um, OPS at 704. I don't know. I just couldn't. I think it shows he you how. He doesn't feel like yeah, an all decade. I think it just shows you how weak the position actually was. So I'm going to take a pick here that might be a bit of a stretch. Xander Bogarts? No. The guy I'm picking, uh, now I'm second guessing myself because I hate doing this because he came up in 2015. So that's why it. It hurts as a decade pick, but Francisco Lindor in only five seasons of the decade is ranked third in war with 26.8 war, only behind Simmons and Tulo. I mean, he put up an 840 OPS for five years for the the decade position, which is pretty crazy. Yep. What really got me was he was an all-star 16 through 19, but in 17, 18 and 19, he had 30 plus bombs and then 15, 25, and 22 steals. So he was putting up power and speed numbers. He was playing gold glove shortstop. He was winning silver suggers at shortstop. All-star those years, got MVP votes in 16 through 19. So he was the guy, again, it's the argument of, can you pick a guy that's played five years of a 10-year decade and put him on the list? I mean, we could have put a minimum on there. Yeah, we well, it's, to, but... it's just like when you're looking at the position, though, it's like, do I take 10 years of Elvis Andrews playing solid, putting up <laughs> (laughs) Similar numbers to what Lindor did in five years. So I I had to pick Lindor just because I think he was one of the top two best shortstops of the 2010s. So Lindor is going to be my shortstop. Honestly, you could make almost the same argument for Carlos Correa, but Lindor, I think, is a better all-around player. Yeah, I I did have Correa on my list. He was my number four, actually. I I would almost be tempted for my number two shortstop, honestly, to be Bogarts. Uh, Bogarts was wildly consistent. Yeah. but that's just me. He did come up in 13. Either him so. or Paul DeYoung. You know? <laughs> Paul DeYoung. <laughs> I almost took Khalil Green. My next pick here, I'm going to have to fill out my, my lineup with a DH. You already picked Big Poppy. So for me, it's it's either Nelson Cruz or Edwin Encarnacion. And this is a really tough pick. Mm-hmm. They're pretty much neck and neck here. I mean, um, they're only separated in plate appearances by 49 plate appearances. <laughs> They're only separated by 20 doubles. They're only separated by 11 home runs. They're only separated by literally five RBIs for the entire decade. Cruz has a higher batting average. Encarnacion has a higher on base. Cruz has a higher slug and OPS. Um, Obviously, defense is not a factor here. (laughs) Their numbers are almost identical. It's kind of crazy, actually. For me, I'm going to go with Nelson Cruz. His numbers are just a little bit better. And... I just think Nelson Cruz was a little more fun to watch in his prime, too. Just that big bat in the middle of the Mm -hmm. Rangers order. Yeah, it's it's a tough one, but I guess I'll go with Cruz. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're down to our last picks here, and I think we both need a relief pitcher. We each have one reliever (laughs) left, so who are you going with? Yep, so this is tough here. There's not a lot of great closers left on the board. They don't have to be a closer. I know, I know. I think... I think I'm going to go with Darren O'Day, though. Mm. So Darren O'Day is not a name that probably jumps off the, no, <laughs> the paper not. at you when it comes to elite relievers of the decade. But when you actually start getting, looking at the numbers, taking saves out of the equation, because he only had 19. So for the decade, he had a sub one whip, 0.99 whip was all. Um, he was a guy, you know, didn't have the same K numbers as a lot of the closers. He had a 9.7 K per nine. Um, The thing I liked about Darren O'Day, and if you paid attention to baseball in the Tans, if you played fantasy baseball, he was always sitting there as a holds guy who would just take the mound and deliver. You know, he was mostly in the mid ones to low twos with his ERA throughout that that window of 10 to to 19. So he's just a guy, I mean, one of those that flew under the radar because he wasn't getting the saves. But when it comes to a reliever you'd want to give the ball to for that decade, Darren O'Day is my last pick. 
<laughs> you don't feel great about it, but you got it. I don't know who Yeah, else. I mean, Zach Britton was closing for the Orioles yeah. from 2014 to 2017. So, I mean, O'Day at... kind of got overshadowed a little mm-hmm. bit, like you said, because he didn't pick up the saves. Yep. But, yeah, he was a dominant reliever. Yep. I mean, his whip was under one for the whole decade. So, you know, not too bad. <laughs> Uh, okay, give me a minute because this is a crowded field here. Seriously, Wehara's numbers are so good. I mean, he didn't play the whole decade, but I'm really tempted to take him. I had him in fantasy for a while. Oh, yeah. he, was awesome. he was lights out for a while, man. Um, this is a really tough pick for my third reliever. I feel like there's about 10 guys you can choose from. I think I'm just going to go with my heart. Uh, it goes against the war numbers, but I'm going to go with Greg Holland here. Mm. Uh, Greg Holland was really dominant at his peak. He did collect 200 saves for the decade, which is uh, only four guys did that, right? Yeah, Melanson was at uh, 194. He got close, but Holland, one of only four guys with 200 saves, a sub-3 ERA, uh, 144 ERA plus. In 2013, he had 47 saves with a 1.21 ERA and a .866 whip. And in 14, almost just as great, 46 saves with a 144 ERA and a .914 whip. Yeah, and he was closing for the Royals in 2015, the year they won the World Series. So, I mean, if you're thinking all decade, he definitely had a strong presence there in the middle of the decade for a few years. So I like Holland here for my last reliever. I feel a little better about him than I do my day or no day pick, but die with O'Day, baby. All right. Well, since we said Darren O'Day, that means we're done with our draft here. Oh, yeah. How are you feeling about your lineup compared to mine here? <laughs> I feel okay about my lineup. I feel very good about my starting rotation. Um, my lineup, I mean, I, I got Scherzer, DeGrom, Granky, and Kluber. I got a lot of Cy Young Awards yeah. in there, buddy. Kershaw, Verlander, Chris Sale, Felix Hernandez. Yeah, I don't. Honestly, I have a couple, I don't, I have a couple MVPs in there. So. I don't know if you could go wrong with either one of those. Yeah. I like. I definitely like my bullpen better than yours. Yeah, as I look at my lineup, I feel like I did take a lot of guys that didn't play the whole decade. It almost doesn't feel right. Yeah. But when you look at the numbers, and I you mean, look I at took the Degrom. I did the same thing with yeah. a couple of my picks. I did but... quite a few though: Yelich, Lindor, Altuve. Um, you know, almost half my starting lineup. I think defensively, I like my lineup better than yours too. I've yeah. got Yachty at catcher. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. I've got. I think Cano is probably a better defensive second baseman than Altuve. Yeah. Arnado. I mean, Beltre was amazing too. Yeah, but yeah. I got Arnado. Uh, I got. Uh, I got Betts in right field over Stanton. I feel like I like my lineup a little better mm. defensively, and I like my bullpen. You've probably got a little more pop in your lineup. You've got Posey over Molina. Mm-hmm. You've got Cabrera over Votto. Big poppy. Uh, you've got Stanton over Betts. You've yep. got a little bit more power probably. But. Yep. Yeah, I'm not getting around the bases as fast as you, though, probably. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> you got old Mike Trout sitting in the one, the one or two spot for you, so that's going to probably push you over anything I can do when it comes to putting a lineup together. So. Yeah. All right, well, thanks for watching. That's our all-decade team for the 2010s. Uh, Let us know which lineup you like better and let us know how badly you think we screwed up and feel free to leave all the trash talk comments that you want. Again, thanks for watching.